It's the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Casey. This is the Godward Show. We're doing some Albert Camus today. So, Albert Camus was born to French parents in 1913 in Algeria. He's uh, one of my favorite writers, which is pretty remarkable since uh, I don't read French. And usually, native English speakers are my favorite for obvious reasons. You know, I don't have to involve a translator like I can actually read what they wrote, which you can't do with Camus unless you can read French. But somehow his writing always translates into English in such a way that it always comes out clear and concise. I can think of few writers who combine a literary imagination with philosophical themes so effectively. It is difficult to write philosophy and Sorry, it's probably more difficult to write good fiction. And Camus seems to move back and forth between these genres and does them both very well. Among his fiction work, you all will have heard of his novel, The Stranger. And I'll also mention a novel called The Plague, which is maybe even better as novels go. Of his nonfiction stuff, the 1937 Myth of Sisyphus is his most famous work. It deals with the question of meaning in a universe where there is no God, and Camus has the courage to force the question to its crisis on page one, where, very famously, he suggests that the most important and first question of philosophy is, why shouldn't I kill myself? It takes him more than a hundred pages to reason through it, but he manages to make a pretty compelling case for living, even in a universe without God. We can, he says, or actually he says, we must, imagine Sisyphus happy. But in this episode, I want to spend some time with a nonfiction philosophy book that he wrote nearly 20 years after the myth of Sisyphus, titled The Rebel. Instead of dealing with suicide, he deals in this book primarily with the question of murder. Not murder of passion so much as murder of premeditation, justifiable murder, scientific murder. So what does he mean? Well, see, decades earlier in his youth, Camus, like so many on, on the continent, had sided with the communists and had seen in communism, you know, humanity's next best hope, I guess. But unlike Sartre and so many of the like heady scholars of the 1930s who never clearly and seriously rescinded their pro-communist thinking, Camus explicitly rejected communism by the 1940s precisely because he saw that it was, or that it had become, a systematic program of justified murder. Well, what do we mean by that? Again, the themes in this book seem to me extremely relevant in 2021, and relevant especially to a lot of the conversations we've had in this little circle of the internet where, you know, many of us look with skeptical eyes at the various forms of political progress initiated by Enlightenment thinking. And I suspect part of the reason that this book isn't better known is that it was published in 1951, and it was all about political murder, and it doesn't really use the term Holocaust, and it only passingly references that whole affair. Instead, the main focus of this book is on, like, the French Revolution, and then the many revolutions that sort of followed it, you know, Napoleon's efforts, the 1848 rebellions, the anarchist stuff in the, in, in the Soviet stuff that follows. So early in the rebel, Camus writes, quote, in the age of negation, it was of some avail to examine one's position concerning suicide. In the age of ideologies, we must examine our position in relation to murder. So you can break history there into the age of negation, and then later, the age of ideologies. To be just a little clearer here, the book is not precisely about philosophically justified murder either. Instead, at bottom, it is about rebellion, almost with like a capital R, sort of like the archetype of rebellion. But what it shows is that these things, rebellion and murder, are inextricably linked. Rebellion, if it is taken far enough, inevitably leads to murder. And yet, Camus suggests, this impulse to rebel is intrinsic in our nature and potentially 
serves an important function, which is, you know, something like a hedge against totalizing institutions, right? Maybe we can talk more about this uh, at the end. I'll try to come back to this, which is like my second or third paragraph. As he did in the myth of Sisyphus, Camus returns in the rebel to the starting point that he calls the absurd, which is a sort of self-awareness of nihilism, if that, may, if that distinction makes sense. There are no gods and therefore no intrinsic meaning. This, you know, more or less, is the famous existentialist conundrum. I mean, by the way, Camus like disavowed that term for his whole life, but we kind of know what it means, right? So, but Camus uh, immediately points out that this hyper-honest assessment of reality does nothing to relieve us of the obligation to act. You may not know what any of it means, and you may not have a list of thou shalts and thou shalt nots, but you still have to act. You have to do stuff. He says, quote, it, he's referring to the absurd, okay? So the absurd is contradictory in its content because in wanting to uphold life, it excludes all value judgments when to live is in itself a value judgment. To breathe is to judge. For all of you, uh, I was thinking last, I was thinking about in relation to this quote about the uh, Myers-Briggs where it's, you know, you're either an ISTP or an ISTJ. And I think deep down, I'm actually a P, and most of the people here are J's. There's a lot of, you know, and I think that makes sense. It's because you kind of have to judge to act. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's interesting to think about that, right? To breathe is to judge. Maybe we're all J's in that sense. So we must press on. Indeed, it was in the face of a threatening nihilism, or perhaps out of a, like, lurking nihilism, that some places turn to politics and ideology as a kind of replacement for the old traditional order. Okay, so, you know, you can think of like, yes, we deposed all the kings and so on in the French Revolution and the subsequent revolutions in Europe, and that leaves this kind of psychological social vacuum. And so Camus argues that this was filled by <clears throat> essentially politics, which is, you know, ideology in practice. But to be honest, I'm kind of bad with reporting on history, especially political history. Here's where I need a J. Otto Pohl, P-O-H-L, to do a supplement video here to help me shore this up if I go a little sideways. But as I understand it, basically the Germans invaded France in 1940, and Camus was there in Paris and did not like that. And so eventually he joined the French resistance movement, <clears throat> but where some of them sought to stave off German fascism by turning to a kind of communism, Camus leaned towards some sort of third way, maybe anarcho-syndicalism or some other esoteric theory that allowed him to avoid being squeezed by either of the two totalizing systems, as he saw it, that sought to take a bite out of Europe. <clears throat> One sec. <clears throat> as he makes clear in The Rebel, in his mind, all of the revolutions and violence of the 20th century follows from the thinking of Marquis de Sade, whom he associates with the atheism of the French Revolution. So <clears throat> there's an interesting side note here that I don't want to be accused of downplaying. Camus was consistent in saying that he was an atheist. But there's no doubt that he was a seeker. And his search was not confined to the like basic materialism that drove most revolutionary thinkers. Camus was a very big admirer of Herman Melville, for example, which ought to give you some hint <clears throat> that he was much more of a skeptic than most atheists, at least most atheists in 2021, seem to be. Which means he accepted that there are limits on our knowledge he may not have believed, but he didn't rule out, you know, <clears throat> higher, transcendent, let's say platonic truths. Basically, Camus was too smart for ideology and not totally content with nihilism. Who is, right? 
he had written a master's thesis on Plotinus and Augustine called Christian Metaphysics and Neoplatonism when he was 23 that traced the moral thinking of the classical Greek world as it became Christian. In Desaad, Camus saw an unbounded insistence on total personal freedom. And he argues that this attitude leads inevitably to the subjection of the majority. So think like, think the revolutionary movements, even think of the American Revolution, right? This idea of like, the individual should be free. Camus argues that this attitude, born out of the Enlightenment, out of the rejection or rebellion of God and the hierarchy that was associated with the church and so on, that this leads to the subjection of the majority. Why? Well, because as Camus writes, quote, unlimited freedom of desire implies the negation of others and the suppression of pity. From here, Camus moves forward historically to the Romantic period, which still emphasizes the individual over any community. And similar to de Sade's outlook, Romanticism venerates you know, transgression of any rules or formalities. So, and then, by the way, from Romanticism, you get the, <clears throat> the arising of the figure of like the dandy, who, like de Sade and the Romantics, tried to forge a new path, but ultimately, according to Camus, only sort of existed in defiance of the old orders. So all of these movements were doomed because they were essentially reactions or refusals of the existing order. That reminds me, I need to do an episode on against nature, don't I? I do. I'll do that soon. Uh, the Huygens book, or Wiegens, or however you say it. Okay, here's another quote from Camus. Romanticism demonstrates, in fact, that rebellion is part and parcel of dandyism. One of its objectives is appearances. In its conventional forms, dandyism admits a nostalgia for ethics. It is only honor degraded as a point of honor. But at the same time, it inaugurates an aesthetic which is still valid in our world, an aesthetic of solitary creators who are obstinate rivals of a god they condemn. Well, I feel like this sort of thing is so true that it's almost a cliche now. You may not be able to see it, you know, because you're swimming in it. It's the way that like Kurt Cobain or NWA expressed rebellion in the early 1990s or late 80s or whenever that was, but they were ultimately canonized and made impotent by the system itself that sort of finally incorporated them and, you know, marketed them and sold them, right? And that's because their expression, or this is what Camus would say, their expression was only a refusal, or as Cobain would say, a denial, right? A denial. If rebellion was impulsive and spontaneous in the Romantic period, it becomes very self-aware in the 19th century. And Camus traces all this thinking, focusing in particular on like Dostoevsky's Ivan Karamazov and the rejection of God. Where, you know, you've heard this before, right? If there is no God, everything is permitted is kind of the apocryphal condensed quote. It's not exactly a quote, but it's like the idea that comes out of um, Brothers Karamazov. Here's an interesting um, guiding question for the rest of this book that comes on page 58, which is pretty early. Quote, uh, the question that Ivan finally poses, the question that constitutes the real progress achieved by Dostoevsky in the history of rebellion is the only one in which we are interested here. Can one live and stand one's ground in a state of rebellion? End quote. And again, this feels relevant, right? As I've said before on this show, I really, really dislike the COVID protocols. To me, the masks, the social distancing, the not shaking hands, it all feels very dehumanizing and like controlling. Today, I was out walking with my wife and kind of bitching about it all. And she at one point just sighed and said, hey, man, nothing we can do about it. So I just try to be like water which is, of course, like how Lao Tzu says you should be, right? And I had to admit, because of that attitude, she's probably handling 
this whole situation of the COVID lockdowns and stuff better than I am, like emotionally, psychologically, personally, you know? But in my head, at the same time, I wondered, well, what if everyone just becomes like water? Won't we all just be, you know, in stables like herd or farm animals pretty soon, like, you know, in the matrix or something? I actually think so, yes. If everyone becomes like water, becomes, you know, just so easy to contain and shows no sign of rebellion, uh, yeah, we end up completely enslaved. And so maybe there is a need for rebellion, for challenging authority, for rejection of hierarchy, for all that stuff from time to time. In other words, maybe this impulse, even if you want to associate it with like Paul's description of sin, right? Like the idea of rebellion is sort of sin at its core, but ultimately maybe that is in us for an important reason, which is that it resists, you know, totality, right? It, it sort of disallows the, the, uh, the, the global lockdown thing to ever sort of fully consummate. Okay, but and this is Camus' next part of the argument, once rebellion starts, it seems impossible to stop. Let me read a paragraph to you to give you a sense of exactly what kind of rebellion Camus has in mind. This is not merely like wearing Che t-shirts or whatever. Quoting from the beginning of a chapter called Absolute Affirmation here. From the moment that man submits God to moral judgment, he kills him in his own heart. And then what is the basis of morality? God is denied in the name of justice, but can the idea of justice be understood without the idea of God? At this point, are we not in the realm of absurdity? Absurdity is the concept that Nietzsche meets face to face. In order to be able to dismiss it, he pushes it to extremes. Morality is the ultimate aspect of God, which must be destroyed before reconstruction can begin. Then God no longer exists and is no longer responsible for our existence. Man must resolve to act in order to exist. I'll, I, I will happily admit that this is the sort of language that doesn't quite hit me the same way as it did before I had kids. But man, back when I was 25, this was it for me. I loved this stuff. By the way, it helps to have read Brothers Karamazov here. What does Camus mean when he says that man killed God in the name of justice? It actually comes directly from the chapter before the very famous Grand Inquisitor chapter in Dostoevsky's big novel, a chapter titled, in fact, Rebellion. I first read this chapter when I was about 22 years old, and again, it was like a real revelation to me. In the chapter, the atheist, Ivan, brings a bunch of newspaper clippings that he's been gathering over years about atrocities committed, usually just one human against another, but in war or natural disasters or other sorts of terrible sufferings. And he brings, he presents this package of newspaper clippings to his younger brother, the, the novitiate monk, Alyosha, and he basically says, you know, what the heck is God doing allowing all this? And if that sounds like an easy question to you, or you've got the answer to that, honestly, you're probably not thinking hard enough about what is called, in theology speak, theodicy, which is the problem of evil. One of Ivan's examples that I remember is... Uh, it was in a newspaper clipping, you know, after one of these wars of the early 19th century or something, and it, and it was uh, soldiers taking the infants of those whom they had just conquered, and remember, this is in the 19th century, and tossing the babies up in the air and spearing them with the bayonets on their rifles. Infants, okay? So yeah, this is like something worth thinking about, okay? I, maybe. But, like, caution, once you go there, once you put yourself in the judge's seat and you turn your own gaze on, you know, God's behavior, so to speak, you have effectively upset the entire order of the God-soaked universe. In fact, you have killed God, you know, 
or this is like this is what Nietzsche's announcement was effectively. And by the way, I mean to me, to me Camus is like the torch carrier after Nietzsche. I mean this guy did not stop thinking these things through where a lot of the 20th century philosophy seems to have like kind of become distracted with things like language or whatever. Camus stays focused on you know the ideas and the consequences of the ideas. So where does Camus go from here? Well, eh, this is the part of the book that's maybe not quite perfect. I mean, there, he, this is all, I, the stuff I've been talking about is just this part of the book, and there are still, you know, 200 pages left after his chapter on metaphysical rebellion. 200 pages after the perfectly clear statement of the problem of nihilism. 200 pages after he says, quote, he who cannot maintain his position above the law must in fact find another law or take refuge in madness. And if there's a fair reason that this book isn't better known, it's probably that he doesn't get all that much or all that like far beyond just posing the question. But to me, that's what makes Camus so good. I mean, I'm a question lover more than an answer lover. He doesn't flinch when he reaches a dead end. All right, this is what I love about him. He, for instance, here's a quote. At one point he says, how can we imagine anything to follow Moby Dick, the trial, that's the Kafka book, Zarathustra, the possessed, or demons, the Dostoevsky book. And those are four great books, and they are books that like, yeah, it is hard to imagine anything beyond, right? And then, but interestingly, he alludes to Arthur Rimbaud, um, but he sort of points out that Rimbaud, the, the poet savant, this genius writer of um, like sort of prophetic visions, I mean, Google Rimbaud, maybe, I don't know if I have enough to do a whole episode on Rimbaud because he's hard to talk about, but like this guy was out there. But Rimbaud quit. He deprived us of anything better when he abdicated his post as poet prophet at the age of 22 to like become a lawyer or something. And so, uh, you know, this is, but that's like, this is where we are, right? It's like, even the prophets kind of just sh finally shrug and become lawyers. Like, there, <laughs> there is no space for a prophet, it seems. In the middle part of the book, as he tries to go on, Camus turns from metaphysical rebellion to historical rebellion. And here he treats of so many of the ideological movements, including some really interesting stuff, like the anarchism of Bakunin and Sergei Nechev, who, uh, I mean, by the way, like Camus, Camus seems to respect those kinds of guys more than the run-of-the-mill socialists that followed them, because at least these guys really went for it, you know? I mean, if you don't know of Sergei Nechev, read a summary of Dostoevsky's Demons, <clears throat> and check out the Wikipedia page for The Catechism of a Revolutionary. Uh, but for the record, although I long ago had an AOL instant messenger screen name based on Nechev's body of work, I disavow now. I disavow. Let me have a drink here. So it's all good reading, this stuff. I mean, really, this is a good book because it's, so, it's such an education in like history and philosophy. It's uh, in, in the section on historical rebellion, like, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I mean, for, for Camus, the turn to socialism was a betrayal of rebellion. And that's an interesting idea to me. I mean, bec basically, why? Because it was a mere substitution of, like, one ruling archon for another. He says of the incipient socialists around the turn of the century, quote, they believed in nothing but reason and self-interest. But instead of skepticism, they chose to propagate a doctrine and became socialists. Therein lies their basic contradiction. End quote. By the way, I mean, I feel exactly like that of postmodernists, right? It's like they say there's no grand narratives. Um, they say there's no God and all that stuff. But then they become socialists and propagate a doctrine. So it's like, what, I mean, what, what's going on here, you know? As Camus sees it, the problem with socialists is the same problem that existed with God that we just referred to about Brothers Karamazov and stuff. Basically, they can't do away with evil. 
but that doesn't stop them from trying, right? So whether it's Robespierre or Nechev, the revolution is only finally consummated when it is total, when the rebels have attained power and now there is no more rebellion. But of course, no such state ever emerges. You know, the czars and their relatives and the family dog all have to be d'autres penseurs ou de, de collègues ou de bon ça m'est arrivé je ne suis pas polémiqueur mais il est vrai que euh, les gestes de, de type déconstructif ont souvent l'apparence de gestes euh, de, qui vont déstabiliser ou inquiéter ou angoisser les autres ou euh, blesser même quelquefois alors chaque fois que j'ai euh, fait ce geste là il euh, y a eu des moments de peur, en effet. Let's see, the, where was I? I forgot what I was saying there. The, uh, oh, so the czars, everybody, you know, the, like the Russians killed the czars, and it's like, okay, fine, now the czars won't come back. But then, you know, there's this, it's like, so then, well, we will also have to kill the most influential of the white guard or whoever else doesn't like Lenin, you know, or Stalin, and the paranoia intensifies, and eventually you get political purges, and so on such that we arrive at like a new Spanish Inquisition, only this time there isn't even the background music of God. And so murder can be justified, right? Camus writes of Marx's and Hegel's thinking, quote, what in fact does the sacrifice of individual men matter as long as it contributes to the salvation of all mankind? Progress resembles that horrible pagan god who wished to drink nectar only from the skulls of his fallen enemies. But at least it is progress, and it will cease to inflict torture after the industrial apocalypse when the day of reconciliation comes. End quote. But of course, that, that day, that one fine day, never comes, does it? Camus sees right through those who speak of scientific socialism. And by the way, I mean, again, here they are, right? Like we have this in the postmodern era, these science with the, you know, science, capital, uncapital worshipers. He, and these people were there in the 19th century. And what Camus sees here is that it all sort of depends on the idea of the new socialist man, this person for whom labor is no longer a disutility. It's all a pipe dream, something that can never happen, because it defies human nature. Quoting again, If there is no human nature, then the malleability of man is, in fact, infinite. Political realism on this level is nothing but unbridled romanticism, a romanticism of expediency. End quote. Big yes to this part in my mind. Big yes from the Godward show. But this doesn't stop the scientific utopians from, you know, pushing, does it? It never stops them. They never stop. Camus explains, from this point of view, the only psychological revolution known to our times since Freud's has been brought about by the NKVD and the political police in general, guided by a determinist hypothesis that calculates the weak points and the degrees of elasticity of the soul, these new techniques have once again thrust aside one of man's limits and have attempted to demonstrate that no individual psychology is original and that the common measure of all human character is matter. They have literally created the physics of the soul." End quote. And yeah, I mean, we are arriving at the NKBD again, right? Like I just saw an article yesterday about how like whatever the, you know, the feds are going to monitor like private conversations on Telegram now and stuff. And it's like, okay, the war on like talking to each other intensifies, right? And you've got like struggle sessions happening on the floor of Congress. And just in general, this idea that like we need, we're going to like finally snuff out bad ideas and, you know, That'll, that'll take, that'll fix it, right? And then everything will be happy. But, I mean, part of what Camus is doing here is to say, no, I mean, rebellion is going to continue forever because 
there are parts of human nature that are eternal and real and these hard limits exist and the system builders always try to like uh you know uh like stretch us beyond those bounds and then what you get is people finally rebelling and so like i said of course that's this is where we are in 2021 again it seems to me except all of this was happening in europe in the 1950s listen to this amazing paragraph camus says quote from that point on traditional human relations have been transformed these progressive transformations characterize the world of rational terror in which in different degrees europe lives dialogue and personal relations have been replaced by propaganda or polemic which are two kinds of monologue abstraction which belongs to the world of power and calculation has replaced the real passions which are in the domain of the flesh and of the irrational the ration coupon substituted for bread love and friendship submitted to a doctrine and destiny to a plan punishment considered the norm and production substituted for living creation quite satisfactorily describe this disembodied europe peopled with positive or negative symbols of power man a dark times again isn't it um camus is an artist I mean, really, like, I love this guy. And, like, if you read his, even his short stories are very good. They often end on, um, like, they end on a note of kind of, like, what's this? When you pull away from, like, you pull up to 10,000 feet, kind of a lyrical, it's not escapism, but, like, a zooming out, I guess. And I want to give you an example of this here at the end of this book. I don't know if it'll quite work as well if you haven't read the whole book, but it's kind of a nice big long paragraph and it, it'll give you a sense of how good his writing is and a sense of how to do a good ending, right? How to stick an ending if you're an artist and not a propagandist. You get the difference here? Like an artist is going to, is going to give you sort of, you know, not mystical necessarily, although sometimes, but like lyrical, poetic, imagistic, tone-based finish line. Whereas, you know, the propagandist wants to make sure that you go vote for the right candidate or something basic like that. All right, so at this meridian of thought, the rebel thus rejects divinity in order to share in the struggles and destiny of all men. We shall choose Ithaca, the faithful land, frugal and audacious thought, lucid action, and the generosity of the man who understands. In the light, the earth remains our first and our last love. Our brothers are breathing under the same sky as we. Justice is a living thing. Now is born that strange joy which helps one live and die, and which we shall never again postpone to a later time. On the sorrowing earth, it is the unresting thorn, the bitter brew, the harsh wind of the, off the sea, the old and the new dawn. With this joy, through long struggle, we shall remake the soul of our time and a Europe which will exclude nothing, not even that phantom Nietzsche, who for 12 years after his downfall was continually invoked by the West as the blasted image of its loftiest knowledge and its nihilism. Nor the prophet of justice without mercy who lies by mistake in the unbeliever's plot at Highgate Cemetery, nor the deified mummy of the man of action in his glass coffin, nor any part of what the intelligence and energy of Europe have ceaselessly furnished to the pride of a contemptible period. All may indeed live again, side by side with the martyrs of 1905, <clears throat> but on condition that it is understood that they correct one another, and that a limit under the sun shall curb them all. 
Each tells the other that he is not God. This is the end of Romanticism. At this moment, when each of us must fit an arrow to his bow and enter the lists anew to reconquer within history and in spite of it that which he owns already, the thin yield of his fields, the brief love of this earth, at this moment, when at last a man is born, it is time to forsake our age and its adolescent furies. The bow bends, the wood complains. At the moment of supreme tension, there will leap into flight an unswerving arrow, a shaft that is inflexible and free. The end. I mean, that's really an interesting way to end a book, right? Because he poses this huge problem question about nihilism and meaning and, and then gives you, sort of walks you through the way that Europeans at the time had been, uh, like, I mean, basically ruined by ideology and politics and war and uh, propaganda. And it's like, okay, how do we get out of this? How do we escape it or whatever? How do we fix it? And that paragraph I just read you is how he finishes. And it's like, okay, so basically we're like awaiting some sort of uh, redeeming prophet figure. But presumably, like, he's not, he's not, you know, a god. He's not descended from a god. We're, you know, this is the material. So how is it going to happen? I mean, what's going to happen here? Well, he will be, what, what does it say? Inflexible and free somehow. So it's almost like you're just going to have to insist against... Uh, against the, you know, the controlling drives of the system or something like that on freedom, and someone will just do it, I guess, at some point. And I don't even know what that'll look like, but that's the idea. I mean, Camus tries to be optimistic that, like, this will end eventually, you know, and I'm trying to be optimistic about it too, but it is hard to imagine. It's hard to figure out how that's going to happen. Part of what seems to me to be implied in that last paragraph is that, like, so... I mean, we go in, it's like, he points out in this book that, you know, revolution, it, like, implies two things, right? It implies political rebellion and revolution, but revolution, like a, like a disc spinning around too, right? Like the cycle of history is implied there by revolutions. And so it's like, once you start on that slippery slope of rejecting God, re rejecting the hierarchy, rebelling against authority... Yes, you're on the dangerous, slippery slope to total deconstruction and nihilism and Jacques Derrida and all that stuff. But, like, you, it's like this is what we do. You have to do this. And, and that's how you get to the starting line again or something. And so eventually we'll arise, we will ar arrive again at the beginning, I guess. Arrive again at, you know, Ithaca, as he says. Uh, what a book. So interesting. I... Um, what did I what did I just say? Oh, maybe I'll do the the against nature book in my next episode since that seems to follow on from this. And also, I hope you appreciated part of the reason I remembered reading that last paragraph um, <clears throat> when I was doing my episode on Aeschylus, where yeah, there's this reference to the Furies, isn't there? Where he says uh, uh, it is time it is time to forsake our age and its adolescent Furies. Remember where we were last time. There, I said and there were three solutions that Athena gives to the problem that the culture is hopelessly split and, and self-destructive and will destroy anybody else who gets caught in it, like Orestes. And we've had one of the three solutions. Namely, she establishes a court system to decide whether Orestes is or is not guilty. And uh, the court, in this bizarre way, because, it, well, just to remind you, because it's very important, the jurors are split 50-50, which just shows how the culture is split. And then Athena gives a completely crazy casting the deciding vote in favor of Apollo and uh, the new gods and acquitting Orestes because she says, well, she doesn't have a mother and she's one of the new gods, so she's on the side of the, 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 man, the man side of things, which doesn't seem very satisfying. But it looks again like you get one of these reversals. It looks like there's a happy ending. It, it, it seems, for a moment anyway, after all, Orestes wins. He deserves to win. He deserves to be acquitted. He shouldn't feel guilty, and nobody should accuse him. 
for having killed his mother. So they seem to have accomplished something. But, and that's obvious, they haven't helped, it hasn't helped the split between the emotions and, the re and reason a bit. Because the jury is just as split as ever. And it's even worse than that because it makes the Furies even madder than they were before. They were already upset for being, remember, repressed in the new... Like, remember, in the last episode I said the Furies are this, these like uh, school marmy, you know, judges by the new morality or whatever. And these, and these are the new order in this civilization, right, as they were in Greece. Now, and, of course, what Aeschylus pointed out is that, like, you, you have to put that in its place somehow. You have to let it, you know, maybe it has to exist somewhere, but it has to be, it has to find a place in the hierarchy, like, under, uh, you know, God and truth and all that stuff. And so he's, and Camus saying the same thing, that, like, we have all these hobby horses in the 20th century. We need to put them aside, put, you know, truth at the top of the hierarchy again, and, uh, and, uh, I don't know, and somehow somebody needs to give birth to a, you know, sort of secular messiah baby or something again. The, maybe the, the ubermensch has to, has to be born, <laughs> something like that. All right, uh, next time on this program, we'll do the uh, Against Nature book. You are going to sign up for the Patreon thing. The link will be in the description here. Um, let's see, it's... Friday the 5th. So it will be next Friday the 12th will be our next secret stream meeting on this show where we will talk about, um, I don't know yet. I don't actually know yet. So maybe I'll just wait on that and see if anybody has any suggestions for what we should talk about next time. But it's been going really well on those streams. I really like them. A part of me almost wants to make them public just because they're such good conversations. But then, of course, we would lose the, um, the, uh, secret stream feel and the feeling that we can talk a little more honestly to one another so we'll keep those private and hopefully that will be an incentive for you to pay me your money if you want i mean ultimately i'm going to convert it into crypto and gamble it all so that i can become a rich man and be inflexible and free see you next time <laughs>